Now we're going to have Reverend Nup teach us the word on the witness and the stars as the brilliant Montana sun enjoys to remain. <laughs> but I'm sure he has a lot prepared for you to bless you, to encourage you, and to teach you. And so I'll hand it over to Reverend Tom Nup. Well, God bless you. It sure is a thrill to be under these Montana soon-to-be starry skies. I don't know about you, but I was up at 4.30 a.m. Wanted to see what it was like dark around here, and it was dark, but not for long. Uh, shortly after 5, the sun came up, and we're still waiting to see our first starry night since we arrived on Thursday. But we know exactly what we're going to be seeing. This topic of the witness of the stars is a thrill for us because we understand it's bigger than the sun. It's bigger than the moon. It's bigger than the stars. It's all about God and God's word. And so we really look forward to having a time together to understand about this from a practical point of view. I think a lot of us know about this or have heard at least about the Word of God being written in the stars. Maybe you've never heard that before, but the goal tonight is for you to understand a little bit about the truth that God actually did write His Word in the stars and that there is a biblical way of understanding the message of the stars. It's not just about astrology. Astrology is a perversion of what God did originally. So one of the goals tonight is just to give you a little exposure to that if you've never heard of that before and show you in the Bible what the Bible has to say about that. And then the other thing that I'd like to do tonight is for you to get to the place where you can actually look up in the sky and see something meaningful. So those are my goals as we go through this topic tonight. Through scripture and demonstration, we're going to answer some questions. The first one is, what is the witness of the stars? And the second one is, what does the Bible tell us about the witness of the stars? And what does God's word teach, uh, what God's word in the heavens, what does that teach? And then how can I learn to read the message? What is the witness of the stars? The witness of the stars, simply put, is God's testimony inscribed in the heavens, recorded for all time. It's God's word to man recorded in the heavens. And when we talk about astronomy, we like to talk about true astronomy as opposed to astrology. You've heard of astrologies and horoscopes, all those things in the newspapers or online. But true astronomy is the study of the stars based on understanding God's design and communication regarding Christ. That's what the true star names are all about. Astrology, on the other hand, is the purported art of divining or discovering secrets or the future by reading the stars. And it's a hoax. But let's go to the Bible and see what God has to say about this. And this will start in Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1. And in verse 14, we read, And God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. And let them be for lights in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth, and it was so. And God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night, and he made the stars also. And God set them in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth and to rule over the day and over the night and to divide the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. So the lights in the heaven, the sun, the moon, the stars, had a greater purpose than simply illumination. They had to because this was day four in Genesis. So God had already 
had light available when he said, let there be light. There was light. And that was before there was a sun, before there was a moon, before there were the stars. So these were later additions. These luminaries were not the be-all and end-all. God is the light. But he uses light in the sky in order to write his word. So that's an exciting thing. And we read in that first verse, Genesis 1.14, that these lights in the heaven were for signs and for seasons and for days and years. For signs. What kind of signs are these for? It's not for signs of an apocalypse. It's a sign about something or someone to come. And that something or someone to come is our Redeemer, Jesus Christ. That's the message there. So from the beginning, God related the story of redemption to mankind by means of... Now, you're going to be surprised if you've never heard this before, but God told the story of redemption by means of the 12 signs of the zodiac. Now, maybe if you're like me, you hear 12 signs of the zodiac and you immediately think horoscope. But the horoscope was man's later addition on top of what God did originally. But God's original meaning for the 12 signs of the zodiac actually tell the story of Jesus Christ, our Redeemer. So when we talk about the zodiac, or when we talk about the 12 signs, we're not talking about man's designs or man's purposes. We're talking about God's purposes. And this knowledge was first recorded in the heaven and given to Adam, and then he passed it down through the generations, and it's recorded in God's Word. We're going to get there. But first, you have to learn about Tom's model of the heavens. <laughs> now, some of you may see this and say that my model of the heavens is cheesy. <laughs> and it is. This is a cheese dome. It has never seen a piece of cheese. I went to Williamson Sonoma and I bought it. I said, this is my model. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about the model and I'm trying to get close enough to you so you can see it. So this, the glass dome, is the heavens. So when I look up through the glass dome, Oh, wow, I can see everything that's up there, all the pinpoints, the stars in the celestial vault. So that's what the glass dome is about. Now, in my model, since it's a cheese dome, nobody puts cheese underneath it. But if it were really representing the heavens, it would also have this underneath and not just above. Then we have this fixed platter. And I've, you've got to use duct tape somewhere if you're putting together a model, right? So <laughs> I've got this black duct tape along the bottom. And the black duct tape is basically a band uh, to show you where the zodiac starts. And I'll teach you a little bit about what the zodiac is in a minute. Then I've got, I couldn't get red duct tape. I'm sorry, I really wanted red duct tape. I got blue. So this rotating platter has blue duct tape on it this moving platter. That is something within the zodiac. So the zodiac starts here at the bottom and then I actually have the top <coughs> of the zodiac up here. So zodiac runs this wide band. Think of this as a highway. So that's your highway, the zodiac. So we're going to go on a ride through the heavens tonight. and We're going to go down that highway. Now every highway if it's proper highway, has a center stripe, right? So the blue is my center stripe going down the middle of the highway. So that blue center stripe is a special imaginary line that God put in the heavens, and we'll talk about it. Now, I'm going to show you tonight how to find the imaginary line in the heavens. So look up, tell me where it is. Oh, yeah, there it is. <laughs> All the things of God are simple, right? So if I were to ask any one of you to tell me where the sun went today. Uh, somebody want to stand up and tell me? 
You want to tell me? No, anybody want to tell me? Sure, Jean. Hey, was that hard? No. Nope. Okay. I bet every one of you could approximate that because you all know that it went over that mountain tonight somewhere. So it had to have started somewhere over there, right? We know that. So we know what happens with that path during the daytime. But when it comes to the night, we say, I don't know. <laughs> right? So where does the path start during the daytime? starts in the east and it ends where? West. West. Did you know that in the Bible, a new day started when the sun went down? Not when the sun went up, but a new day started when the sun went down. Now, why is that? Well, because God wanted you to figure out how the path goes. So, in the morning, it starts in the east and it heads over to the west. In the evening, it starts in the west and heads back over to the east. Why? Oh, well, let's look at this a little bit more. So we've got this fixed platter here. And the fixed platter represents things when, you know, when you look up in the heavens, certain things seem to move and other things seem to stay put. So what moves in the heavens? The planets, also during the day, what moves? Sun. Sun. What also moves? Moon. Moon. Okay, so none of those things are on the planet with the black, on the platter with the black duct tape. Those are the fixed things uh, that are on the area with the black duct tape, and that is the zodiac. So here we go. Follow the black duct tape around the road there. The zodiac is the stuff that stays put. Now, I did these little, I had to have fun with stickers. Twice I had fun with stickers. <laughs> I made these little stickers here of the zodiac signs. I drew the picture of the constellation and I wrote the name for each one of them on here and I put them in the right order. I also went down to the children's store and I got little stickers of all the planets and so I've got the sun in the middle, I've got the earth, I've got the moon, and all these things from the standpoint of the earth, except earth itself, I guess, is, you know, they're all moving to our perspective, right? So that's the moving platter. So the fixed platter is the no-spin zone. <laughs> and then the rotating platter is as the world turns. <laughs> Okay, you got it? Now, here is the heavenly vault above. It's actually below us, too. But we are all trying to find the path because it's all going to be along a single plane. But because it's like the sun going up in the morning, going up from east and then over down in the west, in the night, you'll look to the west. Well, where did the sun go down tonight? That's where I'm going to start. And then, oh, well, I guess the east must be the opposite end. And next morning, that's where the sun will come up. So that's how you find this imaginary line in the heavens. And God helped us to figure it out because most of the brightest objects in the sky are the planets. So, You've got Venus is the brightest after that, Jupiter. Then uh, you've got Mars and Mercury. And what did I forget there? Saturn. Saturn. Saturn, yeah. So those are your bright ones. And then there are some bright stars. A lot of the bright stars are part of these 12 signs of the zodiac. So there are enough bright objects up there that you can follow along and say, oh, there's that bright object. I can tell what that one is. Oh, there's that bright object. Some of them you can tell because they're part of a constellation, and some of them it's because you've used your star program on your iPhone and <laughs> told you which one it was, right? Yeah, really but it's really satisfying if you can learn to do it just because you know it, because then you own it, right? So we're going to try to do that tonight. Um, 
we've got a, a laser pointer and I'll be pointing things out as it gets darker. And if it doesn't get dark enough before the end of the teaching, I'm going to stick around out here in the meadow and anybody that wants to try to figure it out can stick around and we'll see what we can see. And I'm also going to, after the teaching, if you want to come up and see the cheese dome, I'll just leave it right here. You can't, it's, it's not going to break. This is not delicate. So have at it. Okay, I'm back up there. So that's what I like to call God's clock. We just saw God's clock. And I mentioned that there is that center stripe down the highway. And that center stripe down the highway is something called the ecliptic. Now, the ecliptic is basically the path of eclipses. That's why it's called the ecliptic. So, eclipses of the sun occur along the ecliptic. Eclipses of the moon occur along the eclipses. Ecliptic. And then also planetary conjunctions. So like if, say, Mars is getting close to a certain star and you look up and they're, they really look pretty close together, that's called a planetary conjunction. Or Mars might be approaching Venus. So you've got two planets coming together. That's also a conjunction. All that action in the heavenly sphere occurs along that one line, that one plane. So you don't have to look at everything up there and master everything up there. Really, all the action is along the road, and it's the same road that the sun traveled, just in reverse. So not nearly as hard as maybe we thought it was. So that's encouraging. All right, so I think we've covered that stuff adequately. Uh, but that's why tonight we're not going to look at everything up there. We're just going to look at what's along the ecliptic, which is the apparent path of the sun among the stars in the course of a year. So you saw I had the 12 signs of the zodiac around the glass there. That's the path that the sun travels. And uh, so now you've got the basics of the mechanics. Well, let's go now back to the Bible and we'll see what does the Bible say about the witness of the stars. It is God's celestial revelation of himself to mankind. Let's go to the Old Testament. I know you don't have enough light to read, so I'll just read to you. We're not going to a whole lot of scriptures tonight, but hopefully you'll come away with a whole lot of understanding. We're going to read one passage here in the Old Testament, and then we'll read one in the New. And this one is about how the heavens declare the glory of God. I think we started the day hearing that the heavens declare the glory of God. That's God's record of himself. So here in Psalm 19, verse 1, it says, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. A lot of people read that and they say, oh, that feels so good. <laughs> but it's not just that we are in awe at, and wondering at the greatness of the immensity of the sky, but we know that there's a meaning behind it. So it's not just awe-inspiring, it's truth-revealing. Day unto day uttereth speech. And night unto night showeth knowledge. Tonight it's dark. You're going to see knowledge shown by God to you in the sky. Then it says, there's no speech nor language. Their voice is not heard. Everybody, I want you to listen to the heavens. Not hearing anything in the heavens. Don't hear any fireworks, right? Their voice is not heard. But... It's unmistakable when you understand what God put in there. Then it says, their line, and this word line is a measuring line. Their line is gone out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In them hath he set a tabernacle for the sun. So what's the line? We talked about that. The line is basically the same line the sun followed in the morning to the evening. Then in the evening, you say, oh, the sun went down over there. What is the sign of the zodiac over that mountain tonight? Well, tonight, the sign of the zodiac over that mountain is the constellation, the Gemini, the twins. And the, the twins are mentioned in Acts 28.11 when 
Paul was going from Malta on a ship, and that ship had on its figurehead two star names, Castor and Pollux. So the twins is basically a constellation that looks like a stick figure, and the brightest stars in it are the heads. So one twin head here, one twin head here. One is Castor, one is Pollux. That's the sign that the sun is in out of the 12 tonight. So when it gets dark enough, now I don't know that mountain is pretty high, so we might not be able to see Castor and Pollux. We'll just have to find out tonight. But that's how you know what sign we're in at this time of year. Where did the sun set tonight? It set in the section of the sky where that fixed constellation is located. So that'll be our starting point, and then we'll follow along there and see how many of the bright objects we can track over to this side of the sky. So that's pretty neat, because here it specifically mentions in this verse, their line has gone out through all the earth. The measuring line, well, we know what the measuring line is. We know the sun followed that course in the morning. We'll follow it back in the night. Their measuring line has gone out through all the earth. Anybody can figure it out, because you can figure out where the sun went, right? And their words to the end of the world, in them hath he set a tabernacle for their sun. S Stephen, can you raise the glass? That's the tabernacle for the sun. Now, what is a tabernacle? That's right. Uh, keep holding it up. Yeah, a tabernacle is a tent. Have you ever seen a round tent with 12 stakes? Well, the 12 stakes of the tent are the 12 signs of the zodiac around the edge there. So, God is painting the picture for us right here. God, it's like God put a tent over Greeno tonight, and we're going to follow the tent. We're going to start with the stake that's the Gemini over there, and then we're going to go over to the other side. Well, there are actually six of the 12 signs should be visible in some portion from here tonight. Thank you, Stephen. So, in them hath he set a tabernacle or a tent for the sun, which is as a bridegroom running uh, out of his chamber and rejoiceth as a strong man to run a race. Well, this is a story about the Redeemer, Jesus Christ. And it's just as if he were making his circuit of the heavens, just like the sun over the course of 12 months makes its way all the way around and gets through all 12 of those tent stakes. So that's wonderful. His going forth is from the end of the heaven and his circuit unto the ends of it, and there is nothing hid from the heat thereof. Isn't that wonderful? So that's what God's Word says in the Old Testament about the heavens declaring the glory of God. Now, God wanted us to know this also in our day, now that we have grace. So because he wanted us to get the connection and understand that it wasn't just an Old Testament thing, let's go to Romans chapter 10, which is, by the way, the section of the Bible where a man or woman learns how to get born again of God's Spirit. In this chapter, God quotes that section we just read in Psalm 19. And he says in, Psalm, in Romans 10, 17, So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Now, let me just mention something about it. You know, God's word, how did God get his word to us? It was in writing, writing right? So men wrote it down, and then it was transmitted to us. And to get the understanding of it today, we have to understand that writing, which was in other languages originally, and so there's a way to get back to that original meaning. God did the same thing in the heavens, because, you know, Moses was the one that wrote Genesis, for instance. Well, what happened, what did they have before Moses, before they had Genesis? What if you wanted to know about God before it was all written down? Where could you learn about it? In the sky. God wrote it in the heavens. And we'll see just how wonderful this is. So in Romans 10, 17, it says, Hearing comes by the word of God, but I say, Have they not heard? Yes, verily, their sound went into all the earth, and their words unto the ends of the world. 
Well, those are the words we just read in Psalm. Their sound, what sound? The sound of the heavens went into all the earth. And their words, what words? The words of the heavens unto the ends of the earth. Is there anybody anywhere on earth that can't see the moon? Is there anybody anywhere on earth that can't see the sun? Is there anybody anywhere on earth that can't see the stars? No, God set them up so that everybody would be able to see them, no matter where you are. But I say, let's see here. Have they not heard? Yea, verily, their sound, the sound of the heavens, went into all the earth, and their words, the words of the heavens, unto the ends of the world. So, the sounds of the heaven, Psalm 19, words of the heaven, is the same as Romans 10, 17. It's the word of God. God, why'd you do that? Well, think about it. It's really a genius plan. You know, God had his word written down. Now, men have tried to alter it, and they've tried to introduce forgeries. They've tried to adulterate the word of God that was written down by writing down other copies and saying, oh, this was the word of God. Well, it wasn't. When God wrote his word in the heavens, no man ever will be able to touch it. It is going to be inscribed perfectly for all time. Nobody can get at it. It is there perfectly. The only thing man can do is screw up the meaning. So that's what astrology is all about, right? <laughs> so, but we still are able to get back to a lot of the meaning. There are a lot of ancient zodiacs in different cultures. Egypt is one of them. Um, but these different zodiacs, if you compare them, what's really astonishing, God must be watching over all of this because men were involved, but God must have been o overarching this whole thing because the order of the 12 signs are identical no matter what ancient zodiac you study. And the names mean the same thing no matter what ancient zodiac you study. So that is really incredible. God wanted to make sure that nobody could mess with his word and that it was inscribed for all time. And he did it because he's God. That's the witness of the stars. But we haven't learned everything we want to learn about it yet. Where am I? I'm going by memory, so I've got to find where I am in my notes now. Not too bright up here. Uh, let's see here. All right, good. So we just looked at Romans 10. Thank you, Massey. <laughs> and uh, so the word of God in the heavens is just as much God's word as the word of God. Thank you. The Bible, that's better. Yeah, so the word of God in the heavens is just as much the word, God's word as the word of God, the Bible. And it's perfectly preserved and removed from man's reach for all time. So we said we were going to answer the question, what does God's word in the heavens teach? Let's go to Psalm 147, if you have a flashlight in a Bible. Psalm 147, otherwise I'll just read it to you. This is, yeah, this is a great one. Yeah, I guess everybody has a flashlight on your name tag, if you got your name tag on. So it says, Psalm 147.4, praise him. Oh, I'm in 148.4. 147.4, he telleth the number of the stars, he calleth them all by their names. So we learned that God had Adam name the animals. He didn't have Adam name the stars because God gave the meaning behind the stars. So in the beginning, God numbered each star and he determined a fixed set of stars for each constellation. Now this is another thing that you need to understand when you're looking for constellations. It's not like you see in the movies. It's not uh, connect the dots and, oh, there's Fido up there and there's Kitty, you know, and it looks exactly like Kitty. No, <laughs> that's not how it works. God said, okay, these stars are going to represent a dog these stars are going to represent a water boy. These stars are going to represent a goat head and a fish's tail. God put all the meanings up there. And he said, this is what it represents. When you look at it, it's not going to be a connect the dots thing. But 
it's enough that you're able to make an association in your mind and know what it means. So understand that. And then God named each star. He, first, he, he determined a fixed set of stars for each constellation, and then he ordered the constellations in the sky so that they go around that circle of the uh, annual circuit of the sun, 12 constellations. And then he named each star, and he determined a fixed meaning for each star and each constellation. So that's the mechanics of it. What about the storyline? I said this is the story of the Redeemer and the redeemed. Well, the, there is meaning behind the names of the stars and behind the individual constellation names. So, the signs in the zodiac give the outline of the story, and the constellations form the chapters in the narrative. And then the stars in those constellations simply echo or reiterate the chapter message. And the story being told is the story of the Redeemer and the redeemed. And it starts with the promise of his coming, and it ends with the destruction of the enemy. There are 48 ancient star pictures that are visible to the naked eye. Twelve of them we've been talking about, signs of the zodiac. Each one of the signs of the zodiac has three associated constellations. So, one plus three is four. Four times twelve is forty-eight. Those are the ones that you can see by the naked eye without binoculars or a telescope, and they all have a meaning about Jesus Christ and us as the redeemed. So, that's a wonderful thing. How can I learn to read the message? Well, the main way to read it is through study and observation. So, the first thing you'd want to do is learn the story. There's a biblical significance for each of the 48 constellations you can see without visual assistance. And if you want to begin to go down that path, there's a great book by a man named Dr. E.W. Bullinger. It's called The Witness of the Stars, and he gives great information about what they all mean. Then we have... In the Witness of the Stars, if you study it, you can first study the 12 signs of the zodiac, what the message is for them, and then after that you can study the others, the other 36. And what you need to understand is that there is a specific sign that you start with. So the Sphinx in ancient Egypt basically tells you where to start reading the heavens and where to end. So the Sphinx has the body of what animal? Lion. And the head of a woman, right? Of the 12 signs of the zodiac, there's only one that's a woman and there's only one that's a lion. The one that's a woman is Virgo. The one that's a lion is Leo. So to read the message, you start with the woman and you end with the lion. Tonight we should be able to see both of those once it gets dark enough. All right, so the other aspect of this is how do you do star identification? And this can be learned through consistent study and faithful field observation. And my favorite resource in this realm is a book by H.A. Ray. It's called The Stars, A New Way to See Them. Now, H.A. Ray, uh, if you have children, you may have read them. Curious George, he's the author and illustrator of Curious George. And it's really a delight to read this book because the illustrations are just like the monkey. And <laughs> Uh, they're, they're really funny, and he has tremendous scientific knowledge, but he approaches the whole thing from a layman's point of view, and he tells you that, oh, if you want to find this constellation, look for the Big Dipper and then follow the edge of the ladle and keep on going till you hit it, and you can find your way around the stars with advice that he gives. So it's a great one. The Stars, A New Way to See Them by H.A. Ray. So you can learn to identify the 12 signs first and then play around with the other 36. And how do you go about it? You look for the brightest stars first. When you look up in the sky, what do you look for first? The Big Dipper, right? Yeah, uh, so you look for, if, the, if it's not a moonlit night, you look for the Big Dipper, you might look for Orion. Those are the bright ones. 
and then you can look for the um, well, you look for the brightest stars, sometimes those are actually planets, sometimes they are stars, and then the brightest constellations, and then once you figure that out, you can start to look for the dimmer constellations. These are the highlights that we ought to be able to see, or at least some of these, along the ecliptic tonight. Uh, Gemini over that mountain, the twins, we ought to be able to see some of Cancer, Leo, Virgo, Libra, and Scorpio. We ought to be able to see the bright stars I mentioned, Castor and Pollux in Gemini. We ought to be able to see Regulus in Leo. We ought to be able to see Spica in Virgo. And Antares is one of the four brightest stars along the ecliptic, and that's in Scorpio. And actually, uh, tonight, we ought to be able to see four different planets if mountains aren't or and trees aren't in our way. Uh, we ought to be able to see Mars and Mercury, which should be in conjunction with Castor and Pollux. We ought to be able to see Jupiter and even Saturn if it's not too low on the horizon. Okay, so that's like a primer. It gets you started on all this stuff. It's a study that I'm sure would take years to really master, but it's great to understand from a witness of God's creation point of view what God did and why he did it. But before we end, what else can I learn? Well, according to Genesis, the lights in the heaven are not only for signs, but they're also for seasons, for days, and for years. I'll read it again, Genesis 1.14, And God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons, which are appointed times or cycles, and for days and years. Among other benefits, a biblical knowledge of the heavens can also teach us about days and years. What does that mean? It contributes to our understanding of scriptural chronology to the point where we can actually pinpoint exact moments in time in the Bible using God's clock, such as the day Jesus Christ died. Now, some of you may be familiar with this, this in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, that Jesus Christ was our Passover lamb. In 1 Corinthians 5, verse 7, it says, For even Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Out of the 12 signs, there is only one sign that represents a ram or a lamb. Anybody know what that is? Aries. Aries, that's right. So Aries is the one sign of the zodiac representing a ram or a lamb, and the sun enters Aries each year in springtime. Romans, Romans 5, 6, Romans testifies to the fact that Christ's death was right on time. 5, 6, for when we were yet without strength, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. Now, if you were God and you had a clock, do you think Jesus Christ would have died not on time? I think he would have died exactly on time. And I think the clock would have showed that he died exactly on time. And he did. In the year of Christ's crucifixion, the day, the day that the sun entered Aries, the first time the sun set and it was in the area of Aries, which is the ram or the lamb, the, time, the first time that the sun did that, the year of Christ's crucifixion, was on the 14th day of the Jewish month Nisan, which in our reckoning of time would correspond to April 28, 28 AD. That same day, the Lamb of God was slain to take away the sins of the world. Now get this. Was this mere coincidence? Certainly not. What happened when Christ died at noon? There was darkness at noon, right, for three hours. Darkness at noon. And at that point, the princes of this world were rejoicing. They saw the darkness and they said, Curtains! It's all over for him. But God wanted man to know exactly what happened. And he was going to use his clock to tell anybody who happened to be observing exactly what had occurred that day. 
But if he's going to use his cloth, guess what's in the way? The sun. The sun is in the way. You can't read the clock when the sun is up, right? You read the clock when the sun is down. For three hours, the sun was down. Now, tonight, Gemini is the sign we're in. But let's say Aries was there. And so the sun was darkened. What rose up that you could see above it? You could see Aries. Aries has two bright stars. The one means the pierced, the wounded, or the slain. The other one means the bruised or the wounded. So the, prince of this, the princes of this world were rejoicing, saying, curtains for him. God says, anybody got a light in the house? <laughs> Boom! Up it comes. There it is. Everybody can see it. The Lamb of God has just been slain. Jesus Christ, our Passover. What an incredible God we have! That is the witness of the stars. God bless you. Oh.